certificate, certificate student at uh, the New Center, but I'm also a uh, PhD student at uh, Newcastle University in, uh, in geography. And I work on basically uh, different sort of histories of art, philosophy, and uh, literature that try in some sense to treat, um, if you will, methodological and um, sort of conceptual constructs that try to sort of uh, conceptualize uh, the relationship between the self-consciousness and, uh, and uh, the earth. So that is why sort of my entry point into the question of, of the planetary and sort of um, which we may or may not stay with. Um, but um, I've, um, I've been sort of thinking about the scale and not really understanding what the scale is even for, for, for quite some time. And it's, it's just one of these sort of things that I think yeah. it's obviously really important. No, I think I really, I love, I love the, the like the, what you sent was great. I think I feel like, I feel very close to the questions myself and also, you know, don't have any definitive answers, obviously. Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good. But it does feel like everything kind of, like every, all the sort of research that I end up doing kind of does come back to this question of scale uh, in, in some way or another. So I was really happy to, to, to get the prompt. Um, but how did you guys meet? You, did, you, did you know each other previously or? Well, I mean, I, I was taking a, a seminar by, by Amanda that she was giving at the New Center. This, uh, ah, this right, yeah, okay. Winter. And uh, I, I, thought of, I thought of inviting Amanda. It was I actually see. Amanda who suggested I invite you. Oh, uh, oh, what a treat. God, no, I really. We did, we got to read some Altusa together. <laughs> it's like my favorite situation. <laughs> I never really get to read Altisa with people. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it was fun. What was the what was the yeah, seven? I hope you the... thought it was fun, Carl. <laughs> so, sorry, what did you say, Amanda? I hope you thought it was fun. I, I no, was really... it was it was it was great. It was great. Um, um, and again, what did you ask, Diane? Sorry, I didn't I didn't catch no, it. I was trying to. <laughs> no, I was just wondering what the actual what was the what was the was it like a, a an ongoing seminar? Was it like a one of or what? And what was it? Carl, do you want to? Yeah, I know. I was, I was I was waiting for you, but uh, it was called the Images of Reason, and we were basically tracing a different, um, I would say, recent uh, conceptions of of of, the, of reason and the rational, and uh, you know, problems associated with that in uh, in science and the arts. And we were reading Althusser and some. Um, what else were we reading? We were, we were reading two texts, I think, by um, Rubenbaum, uh, if, if you're familiar. Yeah. Um, so we kind of tried to navigate, even though I don't really make a big discrimination in my own head, but navigate that um, shift from uh, like say, dialectical Marxist, pseudo, you know, associated post-structuralist, you know, psych psychoanalytical moments in the sixties um, across to, because we read a bit of Leotard as well and like looked at that kind of stuff, but um, across to like more analytical pragmatism without trying to make this opposition, I guess, but mm. just to see how these threads in the philosophical and the political um, made sense. And also in the background, all the time we had aesthetics and art hovering around. So I tried to keep them in view. Yeah. Which I hope we'll do today. Yeah, yes, I, I, yeah. I hope so, I hope so too. That's. Uh... It's it, it's funny. I guess you know both of us. You know, being I think primarily artists that sort of have this. Uh, I don't know. Pathological affection for philosophy. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but I think probably I don't know. I think I've always identified as an artist first, and I think Amanda, you as well. But using philosophy in, in a in a particular way, uh, I can't imagine it not sort of creeping in in some form or another. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's uh, very unlikely that it that it won't in the, in the sort of context of, of of today. Very good. All right. Oh, it's we're spot on six, I guess. How many people have you been to these before, Carl? Then these events? Yes, um, I, I have. We were. I mean, first it was a um, you know a first season of sheltering places when 
they tended to invite a lot of people and we, I think they were, they were going on and on for five hours or something like that. And then they kind of revamped it for the second, <laughs> for the second se season to make it a little bit more, you know, <laughs> um, possible to actually sort of deal with in, in, a, in, a, in a succinct way. And um, I, I think I don't have numbers for how many people have been watching, but I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I actually I couldn't I couldn't tell, but it's it has been quite good, and uh, it's uh, been um, working or sort of talking about very different themes, but also it has felt quite um, connected. There has been a lot of sort of talk about on the one hand politics, of course, and sort of emerging political projects, and and also um, you know the future, and especially in the sort of the COVID situation and everything like that. So it's, it has been a very interesting um, sort of set of set of talks. Yeah, great. Um, and just to say, I I have a a dean's council um, that after this I'm going to jump straight into a, a fiscal crisis meeting. <laughs> so just to, just to say that at the end, if I have to kind of go say goodbye kind of quickly, it's because I'm overlapping. Yeah, uh, I, I see. Yeah, just to like say that now. Well, enjoy enjoy your your the first part of your morning, anyways, because the second half. Exactly. I know this is like little nice place. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Good. So let's give it another maybe two minutes then, and uh, we'll. For, for these sort of YouTube people to, to catch up and uh, then we'll officially start and see, where, see where, where it takes us. Diane, where are you, really? Uh, I'm obviously in the International Space Station, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in my bedroom. Okay. <laughs> I just thought you might be in the studio or... No, no, we're, I mean, we're still kind of pretty much stuck in not completely but you know we don't i'm I, you know i find i find the whole um i got i got quite used to not going out it yeah takes, me too it takes me more, <laughs> more than it probably should frankly um and you know i brought the big yeah. computer home and i'm showing you our house oh is that the geodesic yeah it's great jeez that's amazing. Building room. It's all got building tools everywhere. We're always building. <laughs> oh, but God, look at those doors and stuff. Beautiful. Yeah. Man. This is my dupli uh, fake Donald Judd sofa that I had <laughs> made. <laughs> that I just did. Oh. But we, it was so big and expensive, I kept it. California. Oh, yeah. I sit on a prop, basically. You know, there is a part of me as I get older, I think, why did I, why did I go east and not west? <laughs> so I'm a glutton for punishment, I think. British climate. Well, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, we stayed up last night watching the live stream of um, the Portland. Oh, yeah. Um, Where's that? March. Um, and it's just... I guess, you know, ever so often I get more and more like personally distressed, like in myself, not just, oh, this makes me, you know, intellectually frustrated or, you know, but touched, I guess, emotionally touched. And it's, yeah, it's been a really hard week with the whole arrests and everything. It's, it's, it, it's a, yeah, it's hard to talk about in a way, but may, I don't know whether we'll, you know, I mean, I think actually last time I saw you was, was before Brexit and before Trump. And we, I remember having this like discussion about, okay, which is the worst prospect? And then sort of having both of them yeah. all the way they did. And just, you know, so we, we could all see it was going to be bad. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's. it's so um, I, I should, I, I'm, I'm going to. Um, start this <laughs> no wor no no worries uh, <laughs> no no yeah <laughs> okay so um 
Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the seventh and um, final episode of um, Sheltering Places of the um, second season. Um, I, I would like to introduce uh, our two guests for, for today, which is uh, which are um, Diane Bauer and Amanda Beach. Um, I'm going to um, just read their uh, bios, and then I'm going to say a, a couple of words about today's um, topic, and then we'll get to it. Um, Starting with Diane Bauer, she's an artist and writer based in London. She studied both art and architecture at Cooper Union in NY and um, Goldsmiths College London. She's currently a researcher at Westminster University working on questions regarding uh, the discrepancy between time, extra human scale, and the linear persistence of temporality. Focusing on what this discrepancy means for how we understand ourselves as a species in relation to the Anthropocene. Much of her practice is collaborative and interdisciplinary with projects including Laboria Cubonics, with whom she collaboratively wrote and published Xenofeminism, a politics for alienation in 2015, and AST, Alliance of the Southern Triangle, a working group of artists, architects, and curators that are, um, use the art field as a platform to broaden interdisciplinary collaborations uh, with, a few, with, with a focus on urbanism and climate change. Um, Diane Bauer has screened and exhibited independently at, for, for example, Tate Britain and the ICA. She has recently completed a project with Arts at CERN and is currently working as part of a team on the German pavilion in the, for the 2021 Architecture Biennale in Venice. She has taught and lectured widely at universities and cultural institutions, including Cornell, Yale, the New School, and the ICA London. And Amanda Beach um, is an artist and writer living in LA, using a range of compelling rhetorical and often dogmatic narratives and texts. Beach's work poses questions and propositions for what a realist art can be in today's culture. That is a work that can articulate a comprehension of reality without the terminal mirror of a human identity that is used to picture it. She's Dean of Critical Studies, California Institute of the Arts. Amanda Beach has shown her artwork and presented her writing at major international venues, including this time a video commission for uh, the Remy Modern, Modern Canada in 2017, a Covenant Transport Move or Die at the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art in 2016, and Sanity Assassin, a neocentric at Charm Gallery, Vienna in 2016, and much more. Um, so, a big welcome to, to both of you. Um, the, the, the topic for today. Um, is going to be on the promises and perils of emerging spatial and temporal scales, kind of as a backdrop for pro different Promethean political projects, beginning from um, a case study, uh, which interests me um, personally, uh, which is the planetary, which has um, you know kind of emerged as a big um, debate, obviously, um, part, as part of the conversation around the Anthropocene and the, perhaps particularly um, importantly, I think, with sort of in, within the context of Earth system science and sort of the possibility of um, calculating and making something like the planetary a, a scale that is under both accessible for kind of political practice and as something that is sort of more generally actionable and thinkable. Um, and I think what we will uh, we can agree on is that scales are not just sort of relations of proportionality and it's something much more as some kind of um, conceptual constructs or perhaps worlds in their own right that can be in turn represented and put to work on other scales, for instance, uh, such that one scale might perhaps require another scale to exist before one can deal with it. But I think we can return to that a bit later, because the first thing I really um, would wonder about is sort of, I've, I've entitled this um, uh, episode, the emerging or emerging alien scales. And one thing I wonder is perhaps, what is a scale? Uh, and particularly with sort of, in the sense, in what sense can a scale be alien or for that matter, non-human? What would that mean? And if if Diane would like to sort of take this question first and uh, sort of 
please feel free to sort of elaborate on it in the context of your own work, for instance, and how you think about what the scale might be and how, how it might be treated and thought about. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, this, this question of alien scales is a, sort of exactly at, at the core of a lot of what I, I work on, actually. Um, you know, as I said it, before, not that I have any definitive answers, it's like way too big of a question, but um, I think, I mean, I think the way I think about alien scales is, is, is just basically scales that are not immediately apprehendable by humans, by us, uh, you know, that you need technology in some form to, to gain access to them. And, and this, of course, goes for the very big and the very small. So you have, you know, like work that happens at CERN, for example, at, at, at that scale, on, on the quantum scale, you know, that we don't need to see, but you can observe, you know, the effects of um, you know, to the cosmological scale. Um, and I think, I think the thing that I'm, I'm particularly interested in is how um, the fact that we can access these scales conceptually, that we have the capacity to sort of understand these scales without experiencing them directly. Um, and they also, it, these scales also seem to sort of govern sort of where we are now in terms of relationship to the planet and what, what sort of happened. I mean, I often think about our relationship to um, the Anthropocene as, as we've, we've kind of inadvertently built, built this um, vehicle that we find ourselves suddenly speeding down the highway and we have no idea how to drive, you know? Um, and we, we sort of realize, oh, okay, this, we really, maybe we should have like read, read the handbook first. Um, but it, it didn't sort of happen that way. It sort of emerged this, this sort of large planetary scale uh, system, series of systems sort of emerged through a series of like small decisions by lots of individuals. Um, and I suppose it's this, this sort of scale of relationship between, you know, what we can do as individuals, what we can see, what we can apprehend, uh, what we can experience in an immediate sense in relation to this very big and very small that I, I feel is a real question or a crucial question in terms of like getting getting a handle on sort of where we are with regard to this large planetary scale system that we we find ourselves sort of um, immersed in and, and in many ways got many ways governed by. Thank you. I, I, I sort of I would like to ask you a couple of follow up questions, but I'm going to sort of uh, post the same question to Amanda first, uh, just with sort of how do you sort of understand what the scale might be and sort of uh, in either in the context of your own work or sort of in general. Yeah. Uh, I mean, perhaps to pick up on what you were saying, Carl, and um, also following on from Diane. I mean, to be honest, there's so many things that your premise makes me think of and there's so many ways I can think it. So um, I guess I'll enter this conversation in, with, with something that the way I kind of, when I think of scale, I go straight to it, right? Uh, this is where I go straight to. I mean, of course I think about the, um, the traversal from an empirical, perceivable, verifiable um, uh, account of the world to accounts of the world that are non-verifiable and non-perceivable. Um, even when we think about the appendages of science, like the lens, you know, like the, the lens that allows me to see both at a microcosmic level or the lens that allows me to see at a planetary level. So when we, when we go beyond um, the um, empirical tools of science, we then get into the realm of not, uh, of, um, you know, conceptualizing and theorizing and hypothesizing. Um, and of course, those acts are constructive acts. They, 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 they are meaningful. They are, they're using language. So I guess that when I think of scale, the main thing that I think about is um, that scale for me is a kind of representational idiom. And um, when we think about using that word, what scale are you using or how, or, or we're just using it kind of like in a kind of like, even like as, as a platitude, I guess. Um, we, we, we're talking about representational structures, like stru um, a, a kind of way in which we use representation to communicate with each other about um, what a structure is and what a pattern is 
and what a persistent form is in uh, one that we can stabilize and then use to communicate with each other to say, given that we're working on this scale, um, we understand this and this. So in a very practical sense, I understand scale to be a kind of form of representation. What is typical with representations, um, they include forms of heuristics. So when, when I think of scale, and I'll give you like a really silly example, right? I mean, this is what going from Diane's reference to the small to the large, this idea of the zooming in and zooming out question or the, um, or even the political question of the interpolation of the local to the universal, which is like the standard Marxian question of how do we think about how we are at a local level and then scale it up, right? So. When I'm in the studio, if I'm sketching a little drawing and I'm there away going sketch, sketch, and then um, <laughs> I think I'm going to make this big, right? I'm going to do a big version of this drawing. But of course, when you do a big version of the drawing as an artist, and I don't know, Diane, whether you do this too, but when you scale it up, you suddenly get gaps, <laughs> like literal gaps, like your, your lines are further apart. The drawing expands and the lines are further apart in your drawing and um, it doesn't work like it doesn't just translate from being a small thing to a large thing and if you make a giant thing and say I'm going to make a small version of this scale just just shrinking it down within a frame aesthetically op doesn't operate because you lose detail then so at a level of aesthetics, I'm interested in this because when I make a work bigger, I almost have to remake the whole thing again. I re rethink it completely as a wholly new structure that requires a different kind of ontological address. And um, so it's not when I'm working in the studio, the very idea that I can just um, scale up and scale down um, is, is a problem because whilst that is possible, what it doesn't allow me to do is kind of think about how bits of knowledge or complexity are addressed within the image. So I either need more complexity or more understanding or I lose it. So for me, there's, when I think about scale, I think about this idea of representation, but I also think about knowledge, like how does, scale relate or correlate to knowledge and who who or what <laughs> right is the not only the author of the knowledge but the purveyor of the knowledge so the scale at which the wh where is the not what scale is the knowledge operating from the, the scale of knowing let's say rather than the scale of the thing that i look at and perceive so i.e the scale of the human versus the scale of the planetary uh, and these kind of multiple scales that seem to be all at work when one thing is looking at another. So, you know, when you think about science, you think about um, the problem of neutrality, for example, you know. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll stop there, but when you sent that um, premise to this conversation, I guess it, it made me think of both this, these kind of more banal practical examples of making in the studio and how we, we, we don't necessarily scale up and scale down when we make artworks, but we, we kind of make everything anew every time almost, but we have similar rules and principles, but the thing itself isn't something you could just shrink up and down. But then this question of complexity, not just knowledge, but knowing complexity becomes a question about representation. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I was just thinking about you know these maps and you sort of um, you make a different and a different scale when, when you were talking Amanda and and I sort of where, where the trees suddenly disappear and suddenly have like a, a green blob and it says forest instead. And, you know it's 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 one of these things that it's I think it's very ingrained in how we tend to to think about scales. And I was throughout um, what both of you were saying, I was thinking sort of continuously. You know, and I was thinking also about the same thing when I was sort of writing the brief and sort of about the planetary and but then we also have something like like the global 
And these are two things that perhaps make it seem as if, you know, this is scale is about so much more. And I think you were both hinting at, at it a bit. Scale, it's, it's not simply sort of moving up and, and scaling and, and down along this sort of, you know, line of, of, of different scales, but it, there's also something we associate with the sort of particularity of, of, of different ways of, of conceiving a scale at, at a particular level, such as, for instance, for, for me at least, the planetary and the global, for instance, is not at all the same thing. They are sort of associated with very different kinds of discourse. And I think this is very interesting. And I wonder either if you are, are sort of, you know, interested in this particular one, or if you sort of can say something about the sort of construction of, 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 of new scales that perhaps replace a former scale or something like that in, um, as sort of, sort of in yeah um i'm I, what do you what do you well i'm curious what you see the difference i mean i i agree with you that there's a difference between sort of the talking about the planetary versus talking about the global and there's like a, a discourse i think associated with each and i probably a an associated politics um but i want I'm, I'm wondering what yours is and yeah I, I, yeah sorry sorry go ahead go ahead no, no, I, I, more I'm asking, I, I'm curious what, where you're coming okay. from. Yes, um, I mean, I, the, the thing is, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I'm completely confused as to this. I, I, I have this sense that, you know, the global is always paired with the, with the local and sort of there's a tension between the local and the global or some people talk about the global and sort of the local and the global and the global and the local. Uh, and, but it's, and it feels like a very, in a sense now outdated kind of um, difference uh, that is perhaps associated perhaps with uh, new liberal politics even. But then the planetary sort of comes from, and that is why at, at least in part from, you know, the, uh, the entire discourse on the Anthropocene and sort of the, and different sort of computational techniques uh, that make us possible to conceive and sense a kind of earth system and is trying to um, move into completely different entities. So it's not only that the uh, that the scale kind of exists merely as a proportional sort of relations relationship, but it's it has a kind of particularity and it treats particular entities. And I wonder, sort of, what, why why is this? And sort of, what what are the, perhaps even better? What are the consequences of of that for for doing things with scales? Yeah, I mean, I think I guess that's that sort of. On, on a very sort of intuitive level, I mean, I think my association with thinking about the global, you know, is, you know, connected to like a neoliberal project somehow. I mean, I sort of feel like that's sort of where, or that's like, like my immediate association, whereas the, as if like the global is this contained thing, uh, whereas planetary, I think is, is like one step further towards sort of decentering us hum, humans uh, in that, you know, it, it at least is like it's, it's, this is one planet amongst other planets and, a, you know, a planet is a thing, you know, that's, that's a very small thing in a, in a much larger system, whereas the global sort of feels like that's the whole thing, you know. Uh, so, I mean, that's my first association with, with sort of that relationship, but also, yeah, it does seem like the, the, the discourse around the planetary is sort of gives gives it gives the planet a bit more um, credence than than the global might. Uh, I suppose, but I, again, I think these are just sort of associations with me, and I haven't I haven't really thought about that relationship or the the sort of the discrepancy between them that that much. But I do. My sense also is that there is this sort of difference. I don't know, if, Amanda, if you wanted to coming on it yeah thanks and I guess it de it depends you know here's the answer it depends because you know if I think about Donald Trump uh, and the Space Force then I think about the planetary has just been another extension of the global and a, a new colonialist project of empire you know the empire strikes back kind of version of the planetary um, where it's just another opportunity to buy a bit of land or to invest in an asteroid or, you know, so it's kind of, um, it's, it has its uh, complete, you know, fiscal organization of, of 
time and matter and space. So in, in the one hand, you know, you can look at it like that. And then on the other hand, one can rescue a kind of, um, dare I say, it, a nostalgic view of the Marxian version of the planetary from, you know, Engels and from Engels to El Lizitsky, where you get the imagery of planets being a metaphor for a true universal communist manifestation. So you have this idea of, well, we look beyond the constrained conditions of um, earthly geographies to find a new geopolitics that can accommodate a true universal communist um, life, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have a, uh, you know, a kind of, I enjoy the Elzitsky kind of narrative and the, the story of two squares and the, the, the design of that um, communist dream. And I understand that it has to, it, it extends beyond the um, earthly geopolitics to, to have its way, if you like, because it, it allows a fiction of um, communism to occur be, beyond the given, if you like, and yet still thinks about it being manifest in the given. But it has to kind of transcend normative geopolitics in order to kind of have this universal communist life being inflicted upon us all, you know, that, that transcends capital. So, I, like I say, I, I have like a kind of, I, 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 whilst I enjoy the story, I, I worry about, um, you know, that story as well now, given what we face with the economization of all planetary kind of conditions. But for me, um, you know, when we think about these terms as metaphors, you know, the planetary is a metaphor for like a, a universal po politics and the um, global is a metaphor for the um, totalizing constraints of difference and freedom under capital, you know, as you just described, Diane, um, you know, the kind of you know, pejorative uh, terms of multiculturalist globalization. Then I think if you think of them as metaphors and you think, well, how useful are these metaphors um, to us now to make these distinctions and um, how do they, you know, allow us to kind of tackle the real structural problems um, of saying, which I'm identifying as the planetary being a, a kind of logical extension of the global globalization. And so for me, the question becomes, well, how does any format or system, whether it's science, art, um, the natural sciences, you know, like um, biology, evolutionary, evolutionary biology and whatnot, think, think the universal, how do we think the universal today? And I know that loads of people are talking about this, not just us now, but you know, how is it to be done um, when we know that, um, you know, that, that as, you, as we've just been describing, that we need to think, I, I would argue anyway, we need to think simultaneously at multiple scales of reference. And um, so how can one even consider not only thinking the universal, but the idea of thinking the universal as a project we could share, you know? So how do such unities even become thought in the political? Um, you know, so I guess I wonder about, I, I don't really know the answer to that. And I don't know if you know, if, you, if you're, if I might, if my, even my question is connecting with you, if I'm making sense now, but yeah, for me, um, I guess the distinction between the planetary and the global might be a false um, distinction. That's what I'm trying to say. And instead, I would prefer to go back to that old word, universal, and try and think about that as a conceptual framework by which to um, rethink pragmatic and technical and artistic structures. Universal. Oh God, are we going there? <laughs> <laughs> here, here we go. Uh, but I, I, I th yeah, I, I, th I think it's very interesting. Like uh, because w what you're doing in that move, Amanda, is in a sense you're you're jumping scales, which is a kind of political move, right? You're you're saying that okay, the the global and the planetary doesn't these scales are, are perhaps 
they won't help. We need to figure jump somewhere else and go to a completely different level and, or, or scale, if you will. And I wonder sort of, ca can one do so? Because of course, insofar as, as you maintain that um, scales are kind of representational idioms or sort of metaphors, you know, of course, of course you can start talking about something different, but at the same time, couldn't the moves that you make in the universal also be reappropriated and sort of made sense of by someone else at the planetary or the or the global level? So what I'm saying is that our, aren't scales in a sense more than sort of their representation and, and use as such? Isn't there some kind of, for lack of a better word, a kind of reality or materiality of scale is something that you can study out there and actually act upon if, if does that make sense and sort of I don't know if, if either of you sort of can re relate to that or to what Amanda said. So something that I keep, I keep sort of keeps sort of haunting me was actually um, something that you you said in, 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 in a, a, a few minutes ago Amanda around around drawing actually and around scaling a drawing um, and I sort of got thinking like okay so the reason that doesn't work when you try to scale up a drawing, you just sort of have like a something you want to just make bigger and it sort of falls apart when you try to translate it. I suppose it's because like the referent is the same. You still have like, the, you're still stuck in the same body and you still sort of have the same, uh, so it's like your relationship to the size of the line and the size of the space between lines is, is I mean, that's sort of what falls apart. So I got thinking like, well, okay, so if to scale up anything, is it, you then not need to sort of scale up the amount of the amount of eyes working on it as such, you know. If you can sort of make that kind of analogy, I suppose. Like, if you so it's if if you if you have a political project just to make it larger, it can't just be done sort of by a single series of thoughts. It sort of has to be done. It has to be collaborative, and then series of collaborations need to then work work together to, I mean, because I, I think, you know, I, I sort of oscillate so much on this question of the universal, like part of me is, is on, on board with thinking it out. And then it sort of, as soon as I start following it, I, I, it, I fall off the cliff and, and I, I can't, I can't hang on to it anymore. And then I, I sort of say, no, that's not, that's, that's, no, that's a terrible idea. And then I go back to it knowing and thinking, okay, well, no, there has to be a part of it. And I keep going back and forth. Uh, with this, so I mean that was sort of my reaction to like, oh, are we going? Are we going to do the universal? Because I, I, it's something that I, you know, for years I've been thinking about and, and can never quite. I've never, I've never really been able to. I don't know, find my real position on it. You know, I keep, I keep questioning myself on it. But then, you know, thinking this thing about the drawing that maybe, maybe that's a way to think it, sort of that it has to be. It's not, it, again, it's not like a universal as defined by a singular. It's like multiple universals that sort of then weave together and stitch together and sort of sit on top of each other. And, and that's sort of how a universal is defined. Um, but I don't know, I just, I, I guess I was just thinking about that when you're talking about the drawing, that sort of, that, that sort of, that's the problem is the relationship between like the single author and, and the and the thing that sort of when when you scale up the authors need to there needs to be more than more than a single body defining it uh, well, so. yeah. sorry to interrupt but when i was thinking about that that's that's kind of what like begs the question for me and and i i i really think that too that the, the question is um like the scale of the perceiver that's what i was trying to refer to this what what scale um, do we operate with or or normalize and presuppose that the level of the observer or the the, the one who is the, you know the, the the form of consciousness let's say and you know often we um, we have historically have not questioned um, not thoroughly questioned the position of um, that thinker, let's say, or the, the, the author of the work in this case scenario, you know, in the studio. And what we've done instead is just um, attempt to eliminate that authorship, <laughs> you know, which is brought about its own set of ironies and myths, um, you know, with, in the sense of even like just thinking about the standard death of the author kind of scenario or attempts to 
um, uh, eliminate representation altogether in art um, for the sake of um, phenomenological kind of experiences or high conceptualism, you know, um, in the 60s. So I think that what, what certain art movements have done, certain political movements is uh, rather than kind of have a quite a rigorous um, examination of the epistemological problem that we face. Um, they've tried to eliminate epistemology altogether, hoping that that also eliminates metaphysics, all the problems of metaphysics. Like the, what, I, what I mean by that is the, the problem of um, correlating um, uh, an, uh, a reality to a referent, you know, like a, a strict correlation, which is what we do when we map things or, you know, make universal under, uh, understandings of things. So for me, that question of the, the person who is the author, the perceiver, the, the kind of genesis moment of the scale, like, of course has a scale. And for me, we require um, a, a kind of rigorous epistemology uh, that has to constantly reframe and remap uh, its ontological condition. So for example, in the scale up, scale down model, um, sh assuming that that works, right? Now you might say, well, in the digital, that works really well. Like if we have the digital machine, like if I'm on Google maps and I zoom in, um, everything becomes more detailed and my, my, well, the scales are operating for me really well because everything is always visible. Um, but and in the world of analog, that we often work in too, um, we're limited. And you know, when I blow up my little green circle and it becomes a big fuzzy blob, it's not the green circle anymore. It's a completely different object in, in my vision on, on a 2D plane in my painting or, or whatnot. So I guess, you know, for me, it's, it is a question of having this serious rethinking of what epistemology is and can do. And it's not necessarily a question of quantity in terms of the more bodies or the more minds, but a question of how the mind can think complexity in knowledge. Um, and I, I'm not really saying that that has to be one body, one mind, one, you know, co-hate understanding of a traditional individual or a sovereign mind or anything like that, um, you know, a quite, I think we can have a really expansive notion of subjectivity and in, in, in individuality or whatever. But, but certainly for me, it is a question of how we can engage with um, complexity um, and how, I guess when you were talking originally, Carl, right at the beginning about scales that were apparently um, so complex that they appear irreducible to reason um, well, is it, do we, do we fantasize about irreducibility or I'm already being rhetorical here, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> or this is a rhetorical bit, or do we, um, have a project of, um, computing the unquantifiable and bringing that into our domain of understanding? And I guess that's what I mean about considering complexity, that if we take um, the planetary, let's say, to be um, the arena of the unquantifiable and the persistently random contingent aleatory space that we will never know, um, and yet we continue to speculate upon, including financially and what, what have you, then we'll always be stuck within a capitalistic modality, in my opinion. Whereas if we actually have, like I say, have a, a thorough project that can adjust both its epistemological and its ontological uh, um, conditions, uh, then I think we're gonna be able to start to understand complexity in a, a multi-level, multi-perspectival condition. And I think that's what the problem is, Diane, is that in that studio moment, we are just us stuck with our eyes, <laughs> looking at a thing in front of us on the wall. There's all these constraints that we, we are of course operating within. 
And, and I guess what I'm saying is we often think the digital is a redemptive space beyond the analog, that in Google Maps, we can see everything and it's going to allow us to kind of scale up and scale down. But I'm a little bit suspicious of um, technological, uh, redemptive technologies that are going to allow us this uh, interpolation from the local to the global, like the, without which can all operate on one uh, dynamic, let's say, or one vector, if that makes sense. I don't know. But I also think it can't, it can't be, I mean, I think it has to be a, an ingredient in it, the digital, I mean, and, and technology. I mean, I think because, you know, because of this sort of condition, that you know we now find ourselves in what what is Bratton call it the uh, the mega structure is that what he, is that the phrase um, you know that we we exist in this in this thing sort of defined by technology already so I mean it's going to have to be part of it but I yeah I mean I, I I'm definitely so, not all, I'm, I'm definitely not technology I'm, save us. technology I'm just saying that to see technology as the only redempt, as the one thing that could rescue us and allow us to scale up and scale down. That's what I mean. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, no, I'm definitely, definitely uh, not, not for the technology will, will save us. I think it's, but it's certainly part of the, well, it, I suppose it gives us access to things that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. It gives us access to knowledge that, you know, uh, I mean, I guess it's, you know, the thing I was saying in the beginning, like it, it, it enables us to apprehend things that we wouldn't be able to know otherwise, you know. Um, you know, one of the questions I think, one of the what questions that, that Carl, you asked sort of in, in the brief was this um, scales depending on one another. And I was thinking about this in relationship to, um, like what we can perceive and what we can't and what actually really affects our lives and and gps was the thing that came to mind so like you've got like the difference in in time because of general relativity like the way time flows at the surface of the planet is different the way time flows where um where the satellites are there's a, a discrepancy between them and then you know we need to be able to need to program GPS the satellites for that otherwise no one would end up uh, if they ever tried to use Google Maps themselves. So, I mean, there's something that's completely in, that functions at a scale that we can't perceive, this, this sort of time difference, um, but is absolutely fundamental to so many of the systems that we rely on from just like how to get the, like wherever you're going to like, you know, local logistics and, and that sort of thing as well. So, I mean, this, this thing about scale existing outside of what we can perceive and, and sort of our, our dependence on technology uh, to access this range of scales. Um, it, it sort of it sort of permeates so much of, of how how we, we live now. Uh, um, I don't know that was a bit of a tangent off what you were saying, Amanda, I suppose, but uh, I, I think it, I think it's quite interesting because you're you're bringing you know the time time into the, into the sort of fold too, and I think that's that's something that we haven't talked about really, because mm -hmm. it's very easy when you mention scale to sort of simply think about different spatial scales, but there is also the kind of temporal and different ways of of perceiving time, and perhaps there we sort of as human beings were even more constrained than what we are in sort of this the spatial. I, I, very interestingly, sort of I, I, I would perhaps. I came up with a name for sort of the 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 uh, problem that Amanda mentioned with sort of her drawings. It's kind of an Alice in Wonderland issue with sort of where you have to move move with the, the scale in order to perceive it. Mm -hmm. And I think simply bring, bringing the um, you know the eyes of of who is perceiving the scale into the mix is also is I mean it's it's, it's absolutely crucial. And I mean I, I wonder then sort of with this sort of nexus of of having to move with one's changing scales. The issue of the temporal, which is uh, perhaps even more difficult. What what are what would our you know possibilities to other than sort of technology and the digital be to actually 
change scales, if it is important, then I, th I think since if, if, if we insist that, okay, the technology and the digital, it cannot be the whole solution, I think what else could we realistically kind of hope for in, the, in this regard? I, I haven't, I really haven't got an answer, answer to this. My, my answer would be, well, it, it is technology, but it would have to come with, you know, different forms of, of governance to be extricated from the, from the sort of neoliberal paradigm. I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, the hope, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know if this is, uh, I mean, I, I guess my, my guess would hope, one of my hopes would be is that how we think uh, could certainly be in there as a tool, like, I suppose, like broad cultural norms about what we, like how, how we think about scale. I mean, and, you know, getting into the, the time thing, I mean, that's like, that's my favorite topic. So I'm very happy to go down that, that road. Um, but, you know, one, one of the, the big, one of the big shifts or one, one thing that I think if we could shift a cultural norm around scale would, would be a temporal one. And it would be around sort of climate change in the Anthropocene because the, the you know, the commitments we, so so humans sort of evolved to, to, to live in the local, right? Like we have like no like historical capacity to deal with things on the scale that we now need to deal with things on, right? Like it used to be like you, you sort of knew a few generations and that was like your extent of time and, and you know, within a, a small geographical area. But now it's like you've got, you know, we've been burning things for 200 years and that will will regardless like even if we stopped like even if no planes ever fly again and, and so sort of covid land is sort of how we live for the rest of time it's like we, we it's already cooked in we've already got 10,000 years of effects from the 200 that we've, we've burnt so our relationship to time is already like functioning on a totally different scale but we I don't feel like uh our our imagination has ex extended to that yet. I sort of feel like we haven't sort of caught up with ourselves in a way. So I, I suppose sort of beyond technology, beyond like the technology that gives us access and, and the possibility to know this, you know, um, would be, I guess, the, the a broad capacity to sort of normalize the relationship between the human in 10,000 years. Um, but again, I don't know, maybe that's putting too much, too much, well, I don't know. See, I was going to say maybe that's putting too much emphasis on the human, but actually I do, I do think, you know, there is this, um, you know, we, we have responsibilities, we have capacities and we have responsibilities. And I, Helen Hester is working on this idea of sapience plus care, which I think is, is, is great. You know, the fact that we have capacities and, and we've messed up a lot of the planet, but also we're the only species that's likely to do anything about it because of the capacities that we have, which are partly technological, but partly not, you know, partly, um, you know, capacities for collaboration and capacities for, capacities for reason and, and sort of being able to decide that this is, is better than that. And, and I mean, it's sort of hard to, it's hard to believe that we actually have that capacity looking at the state of things in the moment, but you know, I still have to hang on to that, that we have, we, we do in some ways have that capacity as a species to decide what's better, uh, despite a lot of evidence pointing otherwise. Yeah, I, I guess when we think about, I mean, when I think about time um, and, you know, Diane, you just, you know, brought, brought up the scale of like 10,000 years and, and then talked about the human scale as well. As, um, and it makes me think about also that, you know, we, we can, um, you know, quantify largeness and abstract conditions like 10,000 years. And, you know, or on the other hand, we could say, for example, all we all are are piles of dust, you know, <laughs> like that's what we're made of. But, you know, a pile of, literally a pile of dust doesn't make consciousness. 
um, it's just a bigger pile of dust. <laughs> and um, I think that, you know, just, so, so I think your point, Diane, is really important. That's what I'm trying to say is that um, we need to still address um, questions of consciousness, but also questions of um, the future and how the political decisions that are made construct a future that we that is lived and we live in and we experience consciously you know every day and uh it for the future uh and you know so, however of course we know that the the conception of again these ideas of like universal truths or abstractions are vital to how we situate ourselves in the world and um you know, I guess, so, so for me, whilst we could talk about a metaphysics of process as being the condition of life, planetary life, the scale, if you like, the temporal scale of all life, it doesn't prevent me from asking the question, well, what is the project of life? in terms of consciousness and in terms of the, not just life as in lived, but sorry, not just life as in like vitality, but life lived, like what is the quality of life for the pl things on this planet, right? Or, or the extended beyond that. So I think that becomes, you know, asks us to make judgments. Um, it brings in of course ethics, and questions of rules and norms and, um, you know, we have language. So I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of necessary and important to think about, I guess, things like a metaphysics of process that defines life. But like I say, we have to, at the same time, like simultaneously operate at a different scale. And that is the scale of the conditions of you know, like I say, this, the, the quality of life, um, the meaning of life, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> it's kind of funny to talk about this, but, but you know, and I might sound conservative, I guess, in saying all this, but that, I think it's, I, I, I still advocate for a, um, a strong um, set of principles around the political. And, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we only think the local or the individual or all these kind of really small um, human leveled scaled um, artifacts, I guess. Um, and it's not necessarily either that we um, have a, a fictional mythic relation to the abstract either. So I'm not opposing, in other words, I'm not opposing the concrete lived now to the fictional mythic abstract of 10,000 years, but to try and think both, um, let's say with a scientific lens, knowing full well that that scientific lens is of course involved in its own heuristic imaginings <laughs> and fictionings of what those things are too. So I'm not either opposing science to the fictive here in that in that sense so i guess for me they're the scales that i think through when my work or try to um yeah anyway i mean i do think this this thing i mean the ten thousand years is is and i suppose needs to be much more part of like the lived reality i mean i guess that's sort of what i'm advocating for is that sort of there's a development of a, a like the cultivating an intimacy with deep time it seems more urgent than it ever has been um and i, I guess how to how to um how to make enough how, how to convince enough humans of that that urgency <laughs> um well, at the same time, I mean, I guess this is exactly the navigation of the local to the global is like, is well, uh, you know, being sympathetic to the fact that, um, you know, 
core material things do take precedent. Like if you don't have enough to eat or you don't have decent housing, if you don't have like really, you know, basic fundamental things, you're not going to be able to think about what happens in 10,000 years. You can't have that intimacy um, of 10,000 years when, when you, when you have to deal with just survival. I mean, so, you know, because we are still, you know, we are still, you know, biological creatures. That's part of, part of, you know, how we, we think and whatnot. Sorry, somebody just showed up at the door. <laughs> but, but aren't we sort of, in a sense, constrained by, you know, in, in precisely at this moment in this conversation, then aren't we a little bit constrained by the by the local and the global again? It's it's, it's very interesting because we sort of think in these terms, but, but we could also think of trying to, and, and this is why I sort of emphasize, one of the reasons at least for why I emphasize the planetary and the sort of emerging as an emerging alien scale, because isn't the case precisely that we need different scales, the sort of unthought scales uh, that we haven't sort of, that don't make sense in this kind of, you know, continuum of, of the local to the global, or perhaps, if you will, is situated elsewhere, the regional. What about the world in, a part of the world in 10,000 years? What about, uh, and, so, and so on. I think, and I think this is sort of why scale in a sense is so important because it, it is so, and I think all, all, all three of us, we're, we're speaking about scale, and but we're speaking about it in slightly different ways and in slightly different terms. And I think, could it be simply that scale as, as such, as kind of a concept is a little bit poorly understood and that we don't really have an, uh, know what we can do with sort of uh, the possibility that the concept of scale gives to us in order to construct very concrete sort of um, ideas and, and points at which we could intervene and do things well I think to, I mean I, no, I, I don't want to really just um Please, say no I'm, if you want to I'm just gonna say what I was gonna say and then we'll see but when I think about art um I know you you know and I think you're wanting us to talk about politics a bit more but I just no, talk about fine, for a fine. minute okay yeah. that's why I'm hesitant okay so I want to talk about when you talk about limitations and limitations of the imagination, but also limitations of the cognitive. I think it's really important because when I look at like the history of art, I think that the history of art, like artworks have constantly tried to deal with um, how art can occupy, but also claim um, the like alien scales of thought, right? So whether you talk about art as associated with the sublime, right? Something like that. Or, um, you know, when even when I think about like Clement Greenberg and he, he would say, blindfold me and take me to a painting and then lift the blindfold and I will see abstraction and I will be in the void. You know, this is like his um, immediacy as presence in abstract formalism, right? So he's like, take me to the void and it's like this kind of uh, context-free experience in a, in a kind of planetary sense, like space and time, immediacy and presence in front of this like abstract painting, whatever. So you've got this kind of advocacy of like art, formal abstraction, like color field painting and all that stuff as being this space where art um, generates complexity because it is not seen to be part of an ordinary language or a natural language, but it's also not seen to be part of a scientific language or a mathematical language. And this idea that it generates the unquantifiable, it generates complexity. And, um, and I think that's why a lot of people still think that, mistakenly, I believe, still think that art is this kind of redemptive space in the poetic, um, poetic excess beyond uh, beyond normal scales, right? So art can be a scale beyond scales. And, and um, I think that that's a kind of problem because um, of course that art by not, if, if that's true, if that's the claim of this art, if that's, if that's like, so if we take that logic seriously or that argument seriously, then that, 
scale beyond scales um, isn't actually taking the site of representation seriously that a scale is. A scale is a representation in my opinion and this, this work tries to um, work beyond representation, like a representation beyond the representational. So I think that when we talk about how we are limited and scales are definitively and necessarily limiting capacities, um, it's important that we think also of um, attempts of a, uh, to defy normative scale and how much they have failed and ended up in irony and mythology and theism, um, such as what I've described, or just trivial claims to the political. So I think there's a kind of, you know, just trying to come back to your question through this example. And I say the same for like, you know, the claims of conceptual art, the opposition to formal abstraction, to say, we hate formal abstraction, we're gonna be analytical conceptualists, like, um, taking on analytical philosophy and whatnot, and you know, producing these complex forms of um, tautological knowledge, like worlds unto themselves, if you like, in art. And I guess again, you see, both of those projects could not deal with the epistemological problem of understanding their own um, claims to representation that are built in. Their own scales were not addressed. Right, and I think that that's a major issue that it's not necessarily always oh, stuck in our scales. We're stuck in the conditions of our scales, but also the fantasy that um, we can escape them. In in a kind of in a, we in other words that the escaping normative scales is a is an opening the door to the abs, to universal abstraction. And then we're there, everybody, thank you very much. You know, I think that's the problem. And it's more to find the, um, the inhabitation of complexity within the scales that we are operating within. And I, I guess that, that's what I'm trying to say about this problem. And by using art as a kind of illustration of that, I think we've seen art fail to, um, understand what a universal structure is or a universal scale, the one that we'd all, like the idea of equality is a universal scale, you know, or justice is a universal scale. How can art, you know, engage with a universal structure or scale if it keeps maintaining the fact that um, all of this is reliant upon an escape from scale itself <laughs> or representation in other words. I don't know. <laughs> um, I have to. I think my my, my internet can, is is sort of being a bit dodgy. So I, I have to admit, I you 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 uh, you garbled out a little bit through some of that. But um, I don't know. I mean, I think. I mean, well. One of the one of the questions that you you sent out, Carl, in, in the beginning, uh, in the in the invite was was this question about scale and and, and politics? We see the uh, impact of scales, um, politics and political thought are scale sensitive, and the question of alien scales. Um, how did you have it here? Purportedly actionable contains for a potential for political projects and ways of thinking. Yeah, I, just just to sort of reiterate on that, and I think that was what I was trying to ask before before as well, in a sense that sort of even even if scale. So, so I'm I'm not trying to make a claim that sort of we can escape scale, and but perhaps that the scales that we do have available. Or thoughts are perhaps associated with certain constraints insofar as it would be very difficult to think about you know meaningfully um, the human and justice on a sort of a, on a microphysical scale it would be sort of very strange to do that and I think in, in this sense perhaps would it be possible to sort of bind certain political projects to 
certain political scales such that one can open up, you know, concrete actions or sort of ethical precepts that one could act sort of jumping off of, of, of those scales. Does, does that make sense? And I, I mean, we can take sort of xenofeminism as, as, as an example and sort of the kind of scale figures in, the, in that. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm trying to think, I mean, I think this is like, this is like the question for me. And, and I, I'm wondering if I am advocating for, I don't know, how did you say it, Amanda, around getting out of scale? I don't know, maybe, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's what, I can't decide if that's what I'm advocating or not. Uh, I mean, I think, I do think with what technology has done is given us access to scales that were previously unknowable. And that certainly has to do something with regard to how we think about ourselves in relation to everything else, which, which ultimately I do think is a political question. I mean, there's this constant sort of decentering of the human that's happened over, you know, since Copernicus, right? I mean, this is like, it's like the constant Copernican revolution of like, actually, no, you're, you're not that important, <laughs> you know, and, and is a, a constant sort of, uh, you know, sort of growing, growing up as a species sort of, sort of get maybe getting out of our teenage years and realizing we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> and, um, but I think part of that is like, is because, is, 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 is partly because we have access to these scales that are so beyond, that are alien, that are sort of alien scales. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's an idea. I think this thought, this thought of like getting out of scale. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of still trying to understand what that what that might mean um, because we are sort of stuck in a scale, right? I mean, this is. I um. I I, I found this this very. I heard this very nice quote that actually I thought I wanted to to bring up here. I was watching this lecture by um. Is it Martin Rees last week, uh, and he. He made the point that so we're very much uh, a, a, a mathematical mean. So it's like we're basically the geometric mean of the mass of a proton and the mass of the sun is 50K, which is roughly the size of a human, you know, and, and it's sort of also we're sort of in the middle of everything. We're sort of in the middle of time. We're sort of like halfway through, you know, the, the solar system's life. You know, we're, we're sort of we're sort of in, in like the meh range of, of everything. Um, so, and, and we are sort of married to that scale. So I don't know if it is an issue of getting out of it, but it's sort of recognizing that we owe our existence to our sort of middling madness. Well, I, I, I think that's why I wanted to bring up the art problem really, because not only does art, many forms of art think that it's scale free, if you like, through this fantasy of phenomenological presence, um, but also people write about art in that way too. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, say art's redemptive because it's excessive of these um, scales that are constraining and normative. And, you know, of course, you know, in like, oh, let me think like in, ah, uh, like post-structuralism, for example, even when you're not dealing with phenomenology, you get this kind of idea of, well, because every artwork can be interpreted differently, it, it proliferates difference um, in, in excessive norms, um, structures and, and normative scales. Um, and, you know, you see that like in Umberto Eco and like that, get that kind of um, uh, art writing uh, and many other people too, and like the idea of deconstruction so I guess it's not just a phenomenological problem, it's a problem of like uh, interpretive uh, language theory and this idea of the proliferation of new stuff. And I guess what I'm trying to think about is that um, the idea of, you know, scale is not a pejorative term. 
uh, neither are norms and neither is representation. And, and um, I guess whilst I can say, I agree that we could look at artworks as um, producing the need to revise and rethink what we think, right? So I could say, if I think about good art, if I see any, I hope that it allows me to revise my art. Uh, it, it kind of organizes our different um, dynamic between an epistemological and ontological kind of space for me. That's what I'd hope a good artwork would do. Now, if, if that's the case, then I could say, well, an artwork is producing new forms of thinking um, that require different scales or different scalar dynamics, right? That's really interesting to me. Um, and I, I guess, you know, just to try and like nail this down is that I'm arguing therefore that artworks can produce new forms of thought. But what I'm not saying is that the artwork itself is just doing it naturally because I, or else I'd say all art did, all artwork does this all the time, and I'm not saying that. So I don't think that artwork does it naturally. So that begs the question of the project by which that artwork is operating with. Like, what does, what are the mobilizations and intentionalities that are involved in that practice? Which is back to a kind of political question and a project, like question about, well, what's your project? Um, is artwork a project of knowledge? Um, for many people, it's not. Um, and, you know, Diane, you were saying earlier, like, we could all think about 10,000 years, but we're all not thinking about 10,000 years. So I think this kind of becomes a question of like, it, it, it kind of screws back into a political question of like a propagandist um, didactic question of like, how is this project sold as a project? Um, how is it convincing people that that is a way to think art or, or even a way that art should be thinking or things that art should be thinking about. And, and um, I think, you know, such a dogmatic didactic position, you know, has its own ironies, but it seems to me that um, unless we start to have more agreement around that, then the form of difference that I've just described, this idea that an artwork can be a, re, ask us to revise epistemological and ontological reference is, is just gonna instead be a set of artworks that just do capitalist difference, just more difference. And I wanna make a dis difference between more difference, you know, just, you know, banal difference and the difference that reorganizes thought. And, and I, I guess that's what I mean by sc scales are required for the latter <laughs> in a much more um, conscious way. But I think this can happen across, um, across culture, not just in art. I mean, I think it can happen in other, in other means too. I mean, I think art can certainly be part of a, of a larger project. Of, of what you're describing, you know, because a lot of people don't give a toss about art, right? Like a lot of people just don't look at it and like whatever, you know, like, and in a way like, if, if, the, if the people that are being spoken to are only those that look at art, that's like, like way too limited, um, you know. But I, yeah, I mean, I agree and, and I, and I'm, you know, I think I'm I'm all for the prop art as like propagandist project. Like I, um, I mean the, the propaganda for what, of course, is always the question. But I, I think I mean I, I think it's safe to say we're pretty much on the same page with regard to what what the larger project is, um, or at least part of it anyway. But yeah. Um, So um, we got, we got a question in the in the chat board from uh, Federico Nito, who, uh, who Amanda probably knows um, at least. Um, I'm, so I'm going to read it and um, respond. Uh, Since technology and the binding of the epistemological to the ontological are necessary to engage with complexity and scaling, 
how would you treat the widespread fashion of a sort of new primitivist sport? Uh, for instance, instance sort of affect theory and new paganism that is currently around in radical political quarters. Isn't this kind of new primitivism a dangerous part of the scales beyond scales, as Amanda mentions, as it would imply losing any commitment to self revision and structural organization by a denomological or sort of law bound or in order to choose a blind whim that is inapplicable to our current context? And I mean, yeah, I, I can kind of see, see, see where this question is coming from insofar that isn't the idea of, you know, of, of affect and blind trust in the, in the, in the pre-rational, if you will, a, a sort of another way of, of certainly getting out of alien scale and the construction of scale to very much attend to the here and now. I don't know I'm what to think about this. I'm just rereading the question because- Yes, just, of course. It, so I, I need I need a minute. Uh, I don't know if you, Amanda, if you want to start, and I'm gonna looking at it some more. I'll just say very quickly because I think I've spoken quite a bit about this, but um, for me, you know, I guess um, there's this kind of let's say I wouldn't say return, maybe, but this this idea of um, a material and a new materialist um, excitement about the empirical and the phenomenological, um, and maybe earlier when I mentioned the, the that we're all dust, <laughs> no, and the excitement about that, uh, like how how brilliant it is to think that we're all little living particles, like everything on the planet. And let's think about life at that scale. Well, yeah, it's kind of like fun, like trivial fun for me to think that, but to take that seriously, like I say, it doesn't allow me to think about consciousness, like I, I was saying before. And it it really, um, I just think it, again, in terms of art anyway, it, it it associates art back with the tradition of um, the Burkean sublime, which is if I paint this mountain big enough with enough lightning and stuff on it, you're gonna have this amazing experience which asks you to rethink everything you've already thought all over again to get out of the trauma that I've given you in my amazing painting, you know? And I know that new materialist artists aren't saying that but when I look at the kind of practices that orientate around um, such new materialist claims I, I find similar kind of problems to this idea of occupying the sensible beyond um, what we might call a normative consciousness. I, I, affect theory and neo-paganism is not, not my area of expertise and I don't feel like I have that much constructive to, to contribute to it just because I don't actually know that much about it. I think my, my instinct on it would be, I mean, I suppose the reason I don't know much about it is because my instinct is to not, is to avoid it. <laughs> um, but uh you know again it's it's not really it's not really my territory i think um i think anything that goes through affect is is uh it's going to be very bound in the human and if you're talking scale in any meaningful way that is is too limited i mean i don't think i'm i'm not totally against uh affect as a as a tactic or a strategy, politically speaking. I actually think it's really, it, it's, it's obviously very important in terms of politics. You can sort of see how, uh, you know, I mean, Trump is a, a great example. You know, I mean, it's, it's how he, he functions and how, you know, how a lot of politics now function. So I, I, you know, affect as a political strategy, I would not, I would not underestimate. Um, but I, I'm very, uh, 
I think I, I think I'm sort of suspicious of that whole territory because it just it feels very very bound by the human. I mean, I, I am I am quite interested in in this idea of of us being dust <laughs> or you know piles of stuff and and piles of other things of other creatures. Have I frozen? Actually, you guys have frozen. No, no, you're 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 here. Can you still hear me? Yes. Can you? See? Yes. Okay. All right. You froze, so I thought maybe I froze. Um, I think. I mean, I, I do. I do love this sort of, you know, the idea of like, it's what is it? It's both Sagan and Fedorov saying that, you know, we're a way that the universe has come to know itself. It's like we're like collection of, of matter. Um, and I, I do think there's something really interesting about, and actually probably politically important about sort of understanding, our understanding ourselves in that in those terms because it is it does it does sort of further the project of decentering the human. It's sort of it. it, it making us less important and I think the the more insignificant we can understand ourselves probably the better um you know and, and being sort of part of systems and actually you know this this consciousness that emerges out of a collection of stuff including other creatures you know like gut biome and that whole thing you know the, whatever whatever the percentage of, of human cells that are not human cells and that, that whole thing um, is, is probably important politically in, in the same way that I'm sort of advocating for sort of a de-exoticizing of, of non-human scales. I think sort of just under, under, understanding ourselves as somehow a collection of, of, of stuff that has been able to understand itself as a as a thing, as a thinking thing, is 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 interesting. So I don't know if that falls into that that those sort of lines that you're asking about, but um, I think I think a lot of that stuff tends to go in in, in directions that I'm I'm quite suspicious of because it is too all too human actually. But Despite I mean, its it's, claims of being sort of more. But isn't there also a kind of you know a a, a way of thinking the human on a on a scale that in some sense is very, as you said, quite alien to what we take in our sort of, you know, given phenomenological kind of field and of, of everyday experience. And that we, you know, the, the affect, much affect theory, I, I, I don't want to sort of stay with it given that you're, you're not too familiar with this field, Diane, but sort of that try to imagine sort of pre-human and sort of pre-individual kind of tensions and even, even it's, it, in, in a certain sense, I feel that, that it is precisely a new scale that has been imagined for thought to sort of grasp and and act upon. So, but but I mean, I guess what I what I really wonder is maybe, given the sort of proven political efficacy of of, of manipulating affect, I mean, I, w I wonder perhaps then how can this kind of politics be put to work in 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 other sort of uh, more hopeful if you will sort of promethean political projects maybe is, is it something that we, one can make use of in a kind of more rationalistically sort of oriented project at all well speaking from here in america the hopes of the reason are pretty <laughs> low. Hello. Um, you know, I just, like, just on the radio, like, I've just woken up and on the radio this morning with Fauci having an interview on NPR. And he, you know, they're saying, should masks be mandated? And he's saying, no. Um, and because we can't mandate anything in this country, you know. <laughs> um, because that means we have to enforce it. And then, you know, he's asked um, the a question about the um, hospitals of being asked to not report their numbers of deaths to their normal um, reporting mechanism, but to take them straight to the White House, I think, or something. And he's saying, oh, well, I can't answer that question. I'll pass on that. And, you know, like even Fauci, you know, 
the man of reason, if you like, uh, right now, you know, is is is, is represented, um, can't has to play the affect game under Trump. You know, he's he's not able to answer quite normal questions, um, everyday journalistic questions about process. Um, so, yeah, I, I I worry a lot about that question, you know. Well, I mean, I feel like, I don't know. I mean, when, like in 2014, 15, I suppose the time, you know, the time when I, I, I met the other women involved in, in xenofeminism and, and a lot of stuff was happening around accelerationism. And, you know, it's actually when Amanda and I did this thing, um, you know, this, this, the last conversation like this that we did was, was then it sort of, it sort of felt like a time when things were about to shift. And I, I kind of feel like our side lost, <laughs> like the, the side for reason lost, lost. And, and I have to think that it's not going to stay like that. Um, and, and yes, I, I, you know, to the question, to the question of like, can Keller Easterling has a thing where she often sort of describes like, you know, two can play at this game that, that, and, and, and I have to believe that that's true. I, I just, I'm not quite sure how, because I think, you know, as Amanda was saying, it seems, you know, you have, you know, you look, I don't know. I, I think, I think looking at the, 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 the situation, um, in, in the US and, and also here in the UK and, and uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's hard to not just despair and feel like, I don't know. I mean, I just, you know, you can have faith in the human capacity for reason, but God damn, if we don't use it a lot of the time. Um, so, I mean, yeah, hopefully, um, but I, I, I think, I think, you know, the left in the broadest sense needs to, to figure out how to how to build coalitions, how to, you know, make alliances across a, a, a broad, a broad um, field, you know, and then, I don't know, uh, yeah. I, I, but, I don't know. You know, what you were saying for me, and, and this is maybe a more optimistic thing to say, <laughs> um, and I, I don't know whether it's naive either, because I might be wrong, but from my experience, I've seen a stronger decoupling um, from um, rationalism and um, colonialism. Mm. You know, like 10 years ago, if I was talking about rationalism, I would have to defend a project of reason against being a neo-colonialist, um, you name it, all the names you could be called for, for thinking about the enlightenment um, or any kind of question of like, uh, questioning consciousness, questioning reason, but also questioning what agency might mean or decision or um, base politics. And um, rather than the politics of um, letting things be or um, the kind of um, hippie Deleuzean projects, uh, vitalism. So back quite a while ago, you might remember, you know, like 15 years ago, to talk about reason, it was um, very unpopular, but also condemned in many ways because it couldn't be decoupled from, um, you know, bar barbarism, the barbarism of enlightenment, you know, as Adorno would have called it. And I guess what I see a slight bit, a slight difference here in, in my scheme as anyway, or my interactions with people is that there's become a little bit more of a, an awareness that they're not necessarily the same and that not all projects of thought, i.e. projects, <laughs> you know, the idea of having a project is, is destined to end in fascistic or totalitarian politics. And now, you know, that was claimed to be a reality um, by many, many people like 10 years ago, 15 years ago and beyond, um, because 
we were fighting against a kind of post-structuralist romanticism, you know, with dare not have a project, do not dare, because we've seen what happens. We have witnessed the end of 68, the failures, and, you know, we can only think the infinite and the idea of the ephemeral at the level of um, political thought. And, you know, I think that there has been a shift in that. And I think that some of that shift is both in the fact that people are, you know, interested in a different type, different types of protest, I guess, and solidarity right now. I mean, someone, I mean, someone did say to me the other day, you know, I, I don't know about Black Lives Matter. I mean, they, they support Black Lives Matter, by the way, but they're like, I don't know about Black Lives Matter because I'm still so motivated by Black Power. You know, what happened to Black Power? <laughs> and um, I, I therefore, you know, just taking the difference in the kind of um, standards there. Yes, of course, there's been a difference in the framing of the political around equality and rights. Um, but I guess, a lot of the people that I know involved in those movements are not rejecting reason and they might have done so 15 years ago. Not the same people, I mean, the movement, you know. Yeah. I think I'm, right. Right. I'm just talking very personally now. I think, I think that, that, I think that does sound right. I mean, I, you know, I think sort of both, uh, I don't know, I sort of speaking about sort of like, you know, as I said, like 14, 15, uh, you know, thinking about the, the frustration with local politics and frustration with protests, you know, not, not going anywhere and feeling like that kind of political action was, was inadequate to the scale of where we are. I do think, you know, there was a writing off too quickly, perhaps, of, of local politics. And I think a recognition from sort of a rationalist side of the argument is, is you know, I, I suppose at the core of, 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 of Carl, your prompt, this thing of like stitching scales together, you know, stitching, you know, so you have something like, you know, um, the, the breakfast for, for kids that was, you know, the Black, Black Panthers did, for example, in the 60s, 70s. Uh, you know, that kind of local program and the necessity of, of that kind of local action because there was no adequate state to, to look after the needs of people that needed support. I mean, also with regard to healthcare, you know, local clinics, this sort of thing. These are really important and, and crucial things sort of as, as I mean, it's not, it's not like the way it ought to be, but it's obviously necessary in the immediate and sort of stitching those sort of local projects. And I think, you know, with what's been happening, the building up of Black Lives Matter over the last, you know, however long, that now is sort of seems to coalesce into something that feels, um, feels different. You know, it feels like something could happen, uh, you know, that, 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 it, that it is a, a large coalition building between, many localized, you know, people that have been working locally for years, stitching to this like larger recognition that this has to be, uh, that you, you also have to think on larger scales, that's that, that some of the problems are local, some of the problems are like, you know, felt in a local way. They come from larger systemic, um, systemic racism, systemic sort of like a system that's sort of built to be unequal you know, and, and a recognition that there's a the direct correlation between like these local problems and a larger systemic problems. And then also like planetary, like, uh, or global actually. But I mean, I think you could probably use both in this, in this sense. So, you know, you've got, you know, it's, it's the, the, the people that are going to be most affected by climate change are already the people that are already sort of screwed by systemic things that are already in place. So like links between sort of this sort of local and that sort of global thing. I think, I, I, so I think, I mean, you know, not to be such a downer, but I think, I think you're right, Amanda. I do think, you know, it's not, it's not all bad. <laughs> with, with, with that, I would just like to say 
thank you both to Diana and to Amanda, uh, because this is um, at the end of our um, conversation now, um, since we're, we're at that time. Um, and this also concludes the um, second season of um, Sheltering Places at the new Center for Research and Practice. We will be back with a third season um, sometime during this fall, so stay tuned everyone. And uh, thank you to everyone who has been watching today or will be watching in the future on YouTube any of the episodes. Um, take care. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to work with you again, Diane. Yeah, no, likewise. And uh, I will I will message you. We should like have a general catch up anyway. That would be super lovely. And um, and Amy, uh, I wish we had more time because Amy's got a good a good comment in here. But um, yeah, I I, I, I think so too. It was uh, yeah, uh, slightly unfortunate timing. Uh, is, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, she's right though, and that's what we've been trying to say that yes, the affectal register is unavoidable. Um, but how do we, uh, it, this is always the question of like any artistic project or the political project is how do we involve ourselves in, in something that we despise <laughs> and see as completely limiting and yet we need to. So how do we become good pragmatists rather than bad ironists? I think that's the question for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Great. Goodbye. So I'm also just going to jump. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.